3.30 p.m. Pacific time. I am going to be streaming live to both Facebook, which looks like it's happening now, and YouTube. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a quick coronavirus update uh, with what I think is going on right now, and then let's do a Q&A. So you bring your A-game questions, guys. Sarah's here, Erica's here. Let's just get it started. All right, here's what's going on so far. It looks like cases are skyrocketing in the United States and in Europe. The difference is deaths seem to be climbing much faster in Europe, and it turns out that Older people seem to be getting infected in Europe, and that may partially explain why there's more deaths. And again, it's country by country, it's regional, it's not a one size fits all across Europe. But what was touted as this big European success, these early aggressive lockdowns and so on, were not followed up with contact tracing and consistent management of the infection. Now, the question becomes, once something like that is already widespread in the community. Can you ever squeeze it away without super aggressive sort of uh, mechanisms like what they did in South Korea? South Korea, they just squeezed the heck out of it early, aggressive contact tracing, which was pretty invasive using cell phones and you know, again, masking and all the other things. If they were able to do it, New Zealand had a geographic advantage, but you know, Europe, it's already spreading everywhere. United States, widespread community spread. So at that point, the question is, you can do those early shutdowns, which were done, and it will bend the curve, which I'm gonna get to. That actually mattered. That actually probably saved a ton of lives. And all that sacrifice up front was probably, probably paid off, and we'll talk about why that is. But once you do that, if there was already widespread you know, uh, transmission in the community and a lot of it's asymptomatic, then what's gonna happen? Eventually, it's going to come back. And I said this early on, which is the idea of bending the curve means not that you stop people ultimately from getting infected, it's that you take the number of infections and you spread them out over time. So that curve, instead of hitting all at once, which does something terrible, it overwhelms your healthcare system, which I'm gonna talk about as well. You spread the infections over time, which means you have more time to learn how to treat the disease, you don't overwhelm the healthcare system, and you end up basically buying yourself time to either get to a vaccine or more effective treatments. What you don't do is ultimately prevent a highly contagious disease from infecting everyone unless you get to that vaccine. So up front, if you look at what happened in New York, the death rate for hospitalized patients was something like 25%. And why might that be? Well, number one, we didn't know really what we were doing. It was very early. So people were getting intubated, breathing tubes were placed in and ventilated because the feeling was if you don't do that, first of all, they're gonna need it anyways. Second of all, you're gonna aerosolize the virus throughout the healthcare um, uh, uh, facility because if you use other ways of providing oxygen, high flow oxygen, CPAP, BiPAP, you're gonna spread this all over the hospital. And at that time, we didn't have enough PPE. We still kind of don't, but at that time it was really acute. And so the concern was you're gonna make all the healthcare professionals sick. They're gonna get ill or die. We're gonna have an even bigger crunch with staffing and it's gonna be terrible. So everybody was getting ventilated, which now it looks like the damage from ventilation is significant. So if you can avoid that by doing those techniques I just mentioned, and it turns out if people do have N95 masks and decent uh, PPE, you're not gonna get them sick in the hospital, so we ought to do that. And that in itself might've saved a bunch of lives later in the pandemic. The goal was don't get sick up front, get sick later. Now the second thing that people talk about less, and people, those of us who've worked in hospitals for many, many years know, the difference between one doctor managing eight or 10 patients in a day and one doctor managing 60 patients in a day, which is what happened in some facilities in New York when they were overwhelmed, is night and, I mean, it's not even describable. I have said this before, hospitalists, these are doctors who specialize in hospital care, I'm one of them, who have patient panels 
of more than 30 patients are committing malpractice. You cannot take care of that many patients effectively and safely. You just can't. And if you think you can, you're lying to yourself. You're deluding yourself either because your employer is saying you have to take care of that many patients or you're billing fee for service and you're making money. And I know there were doctors in Las Vegas who did this. They were hospitalists covering multiple hospitals with like 30, 40, 50 patients. That's malpractice, all right? That means you're not seeing those patients. So, but this is what was happening, say in New York or in Italy when everything was overwhelmed up front, when the curve was not bent. And yes, you're gonna have more bad outcomes when you have less staffing. Nurses already know this. Nurses have been screaming about their staffing ratios and more importantly, the acuity of the staffing. So how sick are those patients? Forever. So the idea of early on doing shutdowns, non-essential workers staying home, okay, that makes sense because you're gonna then get us to a point where we can manage better. But in the, those early days, the death rate 25%. Now, it's more like 7.5%. So what has changed? Well, most hospitals in the US in particular are not overwhelmed. The second thing is we're ventilating less patients. We're using high flow oxygen. The third thing we're doing is we're proning patients. And I did a video on this. We're putting them on their bellies, even when they're not intubated, to keep them from getting intubated. And so a lot more aggressive sort of pulmonary techniques to allow for better oxygenation in patients with COVID. So those things are happening. Now the third, no, the other thing, number next, as we say when we dictate, is dexamethasone. So that very potent steroid turns out to be very effective at the right time in the infection when people are having an immune response later in the disease when they're very sick to tamp down that damaging immune response because that's where the, the body's getting hurt by its own immune response. Dexamethasone has shown mortality improvement in patients. Give it too early, you might make things worse because that's when you need your immune system to tamp down the virus. Now, there's other things in the works. Now, remdesivir is like a rounding error, I think, on helping people, if it works at all. There's really conflicting data on this. Um, and it's expensive and it's your typical pharma play, right? Dexamethasone, cheap and available. Um, things that didn't work in randomized control trials that were anecdotally effective early on, hydroxychloroquine, HIV drugs, um, certain anti-immune uh, drugs like that are typically used in rheumatoid scenarios. So when you actually have the time to study those things, you realize, okay, what works, what doesn't work? And then there's the anecdotal stuff. So doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists get together via Zoom and they share best practices. For example, one of the advances was understanding there are a lot of blood clots that happen in this disease. There's something about this particular virus that triggers clotting. So more aggressive anticoagulation for people at risk, looking at kidney dysfunction in these patients and uh, you know aggressively managing that, seeing these sort of patterns. And then ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in the sickest patients where you, you pretty much put them on like a heart-lung bypass. Um, people learned better techniques on how to make that effective, particularly in light of clotting and things like that. And it's everything from the tubing size, you know, and we won't get into the details, but we learned how to do that better. So if you get admitted to the hospital now with COVID, you're more likely to survive. And we're not gonna get into long haulers and complications and things like that because I think data is still emerging, but we're talking about mortality, your chance of leaving the hospital alive, all right? So it's better now. So those sacrifices up front made sense. Now the question now becomes, as we're seeing in the United States when cases are, you know, at, they're at all time highs. Now, is this surprising? We're going into fall. A lot of younger people have been out back into work, back into school, back into the uh, society. There are gonna be more infections. This is a highly contagious respiratory virus that when you talk about bending the curve, you're talking about smearing the infections out. Now, one thing to remember is, since we're testing more now than we did in the beginning, it's not clear entirely that we have more cases uh, more infections now than we did in the early days. It's just in the early days, we didn't have access to testing. So if you look at some of the antibody studies, I mean, we're thinking 10 times more people were infected than actually got tested and tested positive. So 
it's hard to really compare apples and apples now to the very beginning, but you can look at deaths. Those are an apples to apples thing. And it looks like we have fewer deaths in the US in, in, in particular than we did in those early days per case. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna have more deaths and they're not gonna go up and hospitalizations are gonna go up. We're seeing that happen because there's just simply more numbers, right? But there's a couple of things that have happened, I think, that are modulating our experience in the United States, okay? One of them is, I think, areas that got hit hard early either developed some semblance of lesser susceptibility to the virus, meaning the, the lowest hanging fruit that the virus really liked got infected early on, and the remaining individuals have either some degree of innate resistance or they're changing their behavior. There's more social distancing, there's more mask wearing in those communities that have experienced a high viral uh, load outbreak early on. So you're not seeing those communities resurge as much like in New York, San Francisco, those kind of things that early on we were very worried about, but they took precautions. You're not seeing it yet, right? But places that never did, El Paso, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Utah, these kind of places, you're seeing the surges, especially in rural areas and areas that don't have huge healthcare infrastructure. So that's a little concerning. But I think the other thing that's happened is mask wearing. So mask wearing has gotten more prevalent. The cultural shift has happened. Now, what does mask wearing do? I think when you look at grocery workers, there's something to learn here. And again, watch the previous shows I've done with guests on this. Mask wearing doesn't, so, so your crappy cloth mask that people are wearing, you know, with the pattern on it and all that, even your standard surgical mask, which is better, anything short of an N95, which is a, like hermetic seal, right? And is, it is really filtering air and those tiny viral particles and droplets that carry them. Those things don't necessarily prevent you from getting infected because this is a tiny, these are tiny particles and they are in the air. So people, loud talkers, super spreaders, people who are super emitters of the virus can emit it into the air. And the six foot rule is kind of like, we pulled it out of our butts anyways. There's a little detail there, but we don't need to get into it. So what do the masks do? Well, it might be that they're lowering the amount of virus that actually hits people. That's either emitted, if you're wearing the mask, if you're protecting others, or that you inhale, so it's protecting you. But it doesn't fully protect you, but it might lower the amount of virus you inhale to the point where you get less sick or don't even have symptoms. So a recent study looking at grocery workers, about 100 and some of them, I think it was in Boston, they found that 20% of them tested positive on a nasal swab, 20% of them. So if you look at healthcare workers in the Netherlands, which were a high risk population, 10% of them tested positive. So 20% is really high. It's way higher than what would test positive in the community. So 20% of them test positive. The vast majority of them had no symptoms. A lot of them couldn't social distance, right? They're seeing customers, they're right there, but they're wearing masks. And presumably a lot of the customers are wearing masks, not all, but a lot. So what does that mean? It means that when they're getting infected, they're getting infected in a way that doesn't generate a lot of symptoms. Now, hopefully that translates to they're not spreading it in a way that's creating a lot of symptoms. So universal masking, or at least 80% of people wearing masks, might be enough to, again, bend the curve so that people that get infected aren't swarming the hospitals because they're not that sick. Um, that's important because masking is not hard. And also, you don't need everybody to mask, just enough people. So between the, the distancing, the masking to you know a majority of the population, not everybody, so if you're butt hurt about masking, take a breath, but just enough people that, that can do that, you might still have a ton of cases, you might have a lot of positive tests, but you don't overwhelm the health system and you don't have a ton of deaths and long-term disability. Isn't that the point of the whole thing? Listen guys, and again, I've said this before, 
you are not going to stop this thing in its tracks at this point. You're not gonna save everybody because that's a kind of mindset of safetyism that just, you, you, at what cost, right? So we need an economy working, we need schools to be open, we need the cultural fabric to stay intact. So again, you cannot, and again, if you're looking at an inf the overall infection fatality rate of this thing is around, let's say, half a percent. That's high, it's higher, considerably higher than flu, but what cost would you inflict to get that even lower? And if that cost costs lives, in other words, if that, if that intervention costs lives. So it's not wrong to question the interventions. It really isn't. It's also not wrong to stay calm. You know, the news bombards you with these numbers and, and try, I mean, because it's in the best interest of any news outlet to generate a bit of fear and panic because it causes clicks. So if you look at more balanced reporting, which exists there, you can see kind of, okay, all right, but let's, let's watch the deaths, let's watch what's happening to hospitals, and let's just do the simple things, right? Now, <coughs> excuse me, I coughed right into my hand, which you're not supposed to do. Luckily, I'm a compulsive hand washer. The thing is, if we, if we just do those simple things, people are talking about more lockdowns, more shutdowns. I don't think that should be on the table unless your hospitals are absolutely overwhelmed and you're going to cost ancillary lives from that. So I don't, I don't think that's something we ought to be talking about. By the way, how do you guys like my Doc Vader merch? It's not even available anymore, but I have it and I love it. Um, all right, now it's time to hit some Q&A. Let's do that. Um, Courtney loves reading on YouTube, says, thank you for sharing this information. You're doing great work. I'm a kidney transplant recipient. It can be easy to be overwhelmed with what you view on the news. Thanks for the sanity. Let's talk about that. So there's something called an availability cascade. And what that means is humans are social creatures. So when we are bombarded with a particular stream of information and it becomes socially, socially advantageous to regurgitate that. So in other words, the news is constantly saying, look at all the cases, look at all the cases, look at all the cases, but then you're looking around you going, well, I'm not seeing people dying and um, I'm wearing a mask and everything's okay and you know we're, we're avoiding high risk things. Well, it, it really becomes a kind of a conditioning to go, oh no, the sky is falling, you know, and you, at, with your kidney transplant, you're at risk, you're immunocompromised, you're taking immunocompromising medications. So for you, this is a major issue, like this can generate a lot of fear, but for you, wearing a mask, avoiding crowds, staying away from people that you think um, are higher risk, and allowing that degree of risk modulation for yourself, well, that's a way of having some control over your outcome, right? Without losing yourself to fear. And I think, again, we're, we're risking now, especially during this really heated season now, the politics are happening and all that, we're risking generating more panic that is not gonna improve outcomes and in fact is gonna skew our thinking with this availability cascade. We have the availability of information here and then because we're so social, we then regurgitate this idea without really clearly thinking or debating or looking at the data with various different lenses and going, okay, what, what, what are some ways that this could be understood that aren't the conventional wisdom but that also have the same goal which is keep as many people safe as possible without destroying livelihoods and the culture, the cultural fabric. Um, let's read some more. Um, let's see. I'm a pedi I was a pediatric nurse for 40 years, Alana Fabian on Facebook. I worked in the ED and the NICU. I wore masks when caring for patients that had respiratory infections. I never got sick. I believe the mask protected me. If you look at what we're told to do for a specific diagnosis, contact versus respiratory, et cetera. I mean, that's it. We know in healthcare settings, masks work. What we don't know is we don't have compelling randomized data in public that public mask wearing works, but we can extrapolate some observational data. And again, I would refer you to the interviews I've done with Monica Gandhi that, hey, 
it's a low cost intervention that if it lowers viral inoculum in the public, even wearing crappy masks, that can be a huge benefit. And it can get us back to, back to work, back to school. We ought to be doing that. Um, let's see, let's see. I'm trying to find some questions here. A lot of comments, people talking about herbal cures. Let's see. Okay, 101 Taiga on YouTube says, death rates lag positive rates by four to eight weeks, right? So let's revisit this in eight weeks and see how many more people have died. So 101, it's actually more like a three-week lag. It can be longer, but on average. And actually, we've been talking about this lag for months. So as cases rose in the US, everyone's like, okay, now wait, now the deaths, now the deaths, now the deaths. They never surged to levels that we saw in the very beginning. Now, they may still, we could be, especially as we enter winter, that's not off the table, and you should change your mind when data changes. But what we're seeing right now is, okay, the cases have been up for quite a while, and if you look at the deaths, they went like this early on, and then they went up a little with the cases, but not as much. And again, some of that is better treatment, some of that is younger people getting infected, and older people being more cautious. So... I actually, we don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not gonna pro prognosticate what's gonna happen, but I think um, cases and deaths are very different things, um, especially when you're talking about age, age adjusted. Which by the way, so one thing I should say, the mortality rates in hospitals are age adjusted, meaning it's not just that younger people are getting admitted to the hospital and therefore they're not dying. Even adjusting for age, mortalities drop from you know 25% to around seven something in the study that, I'm citing. So Sarah Rayner, uh, it's a very privileged perspective not to see people dying around them. I work with lower income Latino families in my community and the virus is harming them at a much higher rate. Let's talk about that. Absolutely. In Latino, African-American populations, minority Pacific Islander populations, certain Asian communities, this virus is devastating. Why? what we don't fully know, but some of it is because they don't get the luxury of distancing. They're not part of the zoomocracy where we can sit here and work from home at a distance and tell people to stay home and close the schools and all of that. They're the ones taking the brunt of it. Now, some of that is diseases of chronic stress and food deserts and those kind of things like diabetes, poor metabolic health, which are more common in Latino African-American populations, Pacific Islander populations. We know that your metabolic health correlates to how well you survive the coronavirus. And that metabolic health is poorer in communities that have poor socioeconomic status. Your zip code matters more than your even your genetic code in that case. And so, yes, it's a privileged position to talk about that. Yes, if you look at El Paso, large Latino population, they are struggling now. And again, essential workers a lot of the time. So we don't understand entirely why those communities are so hard hit, but some of it is multi-generations living in a single house. So if someone comes home sick, they infect, infect everybody. There's a lot of different things that are going on, right? Now, and I suspect that that is partially a reason why large communities in parts of the United States are blowing this thing off because they don't see or care as much about the people who are most affected, which are low socioeconomic status minority groups. Let's be authentically honest here. You're asked to shut down your town, whereas 60 odd percent of the deaths are in minority communities and you're not in that community. The self-other dichotomy becomes real and you can judge that however you like, but it happens, it happens. I mean, that's a real thing. Uh, so thanks for that comment. Let's see. Um, Linda Hess says, I'm elderly on Facebook. I can die from this, but I must work. I'm not old enough for social security and employment benefits, unemployment benefits ran out for me. Been safe for now, but now I have to go to work. What can I do? Depends on what you do and what your other risk factors are apart from age. But masking would be a good start. And surgical masks are better. You can get them online. I mean, surgical masks are better than the crappy cloth masks, although anything's better than nothing, we think. And um, you have to measure your own risk. Because remember, 
the risk of an older person, older than 65, dying of coronavirus is two times the risk of dying in a car accident. For someone younger than 24, the risk of dying in a car accident is 36 times higher than dying of COVID. So you have to behave in a way that's appropriate to how you are calculating risk, which means you have to understand and not over or underestimate what your risk is, which means you gotta science the crap out of it and not just listen to news, but actually read and, t and get a diversity of inputs on this. Um, let's see. Questions, questions, questions. Staying away from crowds, Teresa Adams. That's a good idea, particularly things like bars and restaurants indoors. That's where a lot of the spreading occurs. But now we're seeing it in family gatherings that are smaller, where you think everybody's safe, but they're asymptomatic, which means we need better testing. We need better antigen, rapid antigen testing that's more accessible and easy and turnaround times are rapid. Then you could just go, okay, everybody take the test before they come to the dinner party. At least you can do that, right? Um, let's see, questions. How can a family safely gather indoors for Thanksgiving? Ah, it rolled away, so I can't say who said it. It was a YouTube comment, but basically asking how to get it. So this is the thing about Thanksgiving. You have to calculate your risk tolerance. If your family is a bunch of young people and they're willing to take that risk, get together and just be safe. Wash hands, you know, if you can distance a little bit, try it, but it's tough. It's tough, let's be honest. Otherwise, you're gonna have to do some remote stuff and mix it in, maybe drop off food for relatives. You know, the travel is really tricky. I actually think planes are kind of safe, you know? Everybody's masked up, there's decent ventilation, but it's it's the act of getting together. And if you have elderly relatives and that kind of thing, you may wanna say, you know, risk is not worth the benefit. And honestly, sometimes the psychological hit of Thanksgiving is seeing people. <laughs> So weigh that too, because we're pretty fragile psychologically because we've been living in a culture of fear. Um, man, it, I don't know why, but this thing, these comments are scrolling so fast. Uh, let's see. Who would even go to a family gathering for Thanksgiving when we got COVID? Uh, sharp sniper. Well, that's the thing. A lot of people would, you know? I, I think you weigh your risk. You say, well, you know, I think it's important that we see family. Well, fine, that's a personal decision that you make. Now, if we had really good testing that only tested people when they were high titers and infectious, like what Michael Mina from Harvard proposes, the salivary antigen test, um, man, we could get back to all kinds of activities because you could just test every day with a strip that costs a dollar. Read it yourself, oh, it's red. I'm infected, I better quarantine and get a backup PCR test to, to show that it wasn't a false positive. I'm blue, okay, there's still a chance I'm infected, but it's low, and I'm even if I am infected, I'm not spewing, I don't have a high viral antigen count, well, probably okay. Um, that would be very helpful. Uh, let's see. What's all this I hear about vitamin D deficiency, mud valve on YouTube? Okay, vitamin D deficiency has been associated, it's been correlated to people who get admitted with COVID and so on. And the question is, is low vitamin D in itself a cause of having higher risk for bad COVID outcome or COVID infection, or is it correlated? In other words, is it a marker of something else? So in other words, people with low vitamin D levels have other problems that put them at risk for COVID. You know, for example, a low vitamin D, I'm just making this up now, a low vitamin D level means you're not outside as much, which means maybe you're less healthy at baseline and you exercise outdoors less, and therefore you have other problems that ride along that have nothing to do with vitamin D that now put you at risk for COVID. So this idea of, giving everybody, so you know, a lot of data and studies on vitamin D historically have not panned out for actually replacing it and having it a big benefit. So the question is, does it help in COVID or does it hurt? Can it hurt? Well, if it doesn't hurt much, taking a vitamin D supplement, going out in the sun a little bit, probably not a terrible thing, but I'm not compelled that vitamin D in itself is a preventative for COVID. Uh, that's what I think based on what I've seen so far. Now that could change if new data comes out. Now the other thing about going outside 
is do it. The, th this is something that's upsetting. You know, there really have been barely any transmitted cases that have been documented from outdoor transmission. So get outside. You know, all this stay home stuff, get outside of your house. Um, the, the data for masking outside is pretty, pretty effing weak too. But hey, if it makes people feel better, you know, when you pass them, put it on. But you know, I'm not gonna wear a mask on a hiking trail unless there's an old person passing me. I'll put it over my face, no big deal. Cause you're breathing hard and you're right in someone's face. Other than that, you know, crazy. Um, let's see. Please discuss viral load, Daniel Sylvester, I did earlier with masking. Um, don't forget, you can still get COVID influenza A and B at the same time, Julie Ann. All right, let's talk about that real quick. It's a great point. <sighs> influenza season's coming. Turns out the Australians had a pretty weak season, right? But they have pretty significant restrictions. Like I have a fan in Melbourne who was telling me, you know, they've been pretty locked down. And um, so hopefully our season isn't too severe, but I got my flu shot at um, Target the other day with my kids and my wife got hers at Stanford, get your flu shot. There's some data, and this is interesting. So there's some data that says that the flu shot may have some cross protection or be associated with some protection against COVID. So people get flu shots, less COVID. Again, causation, correlation. They showed the same thing with MMR vaccination, measles, mumps, rubella. And people who get that seem to be less likely to get and die of COVID, okay. Why would that be? Is the vaccination itself having some cross immunogenicity causing the immune system to be fired up and protecting you against COVID? Or are people who tend to get flu shots and MMR vaccines, people who are in better shape, more mindful of their health, more likely to take other precautions? Seems to me that's more likely. But bottom line, get your dang flu shot. Because having flu by itself is bad. Having flu with COVID, terrible. Uh, very bad, and there's already been a documented case of that um, during this season. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. These are a lot of good comments here. Ah, here we go. Jackie Jaku, Jack, Jakukowitz uh, on Facebook. My senior in high school is extremely depressed and disconnected right now. When will the powers that be start concentrating on the mental health of those whom are highly affected by the effects of these restrictions? Yeah, we are myopic. We're freaking out about a virus with an infection fatality rate of 0.5. In kids, that infection fatality rate is like 0 0.005. It's tiny. We are wrecking their education, wrecking their mental health, wrecking their socialization. We are scaring people out of coming to the hospital for normal screening or the clinic for normal screening of cancers, mental health, other things like that. And we've upended our way of life for something that is already pretty out of hand, but that we could control with simple measures like masking, distancing, washing hands, and continuing to science the crap out of it so that we can treat it better. And yet, and this is my editorializing, guys, and yet we're creating a, a, a mental health tsunami, substance abuse, depression, alcohol, domestic abuse, the economic, disaster, people losing their businesses and their jobs and their livelihoods. And and we just kind of go, eh. And you know, and people say, oh, well, that's a straw man. No, people are worried about that. Yeah, but not really. Because if they were worried about that, we would have done more about that, but we haven't. So what, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see as European countries go into full lockdowns again, as their cases surge and the deaths go up, because it's actually a lot of older people are getting affected in Europe. Are we gonna see the tolerance on the part of those populations for dealing with pretty draconian lockdown measures? We're gonna find out. It's one thing to clap for healthcare professionals and lockdown and sing from your balcony in Italy in the first wave. Will that happen in a second wave of lockdowns when people have pandemic fatigue? And again, they're kind of seeing, okay, well, this is what this is. Okay, can I live with this risk? It's a valid question, you guys. Um, it really is. Dental hygienist here, Caitlin Bossard on YouTube. It's amazing how many broken teeth we've seen. People are clenching and grinding a lot due to stress. Exactly. I've heard this, cracking teeth and all that. I cracked a, a, a crown 
uh, a molar, I should say, in um, uh, pre-med at UC Berkeley, because I was so stressed. I was taking like 21 units. I was trying to graduate in three years, which I eventually, which I did do. And so it was my last semester and I was taking the MCAT and applying to school and trying to get a research associate position and all this other stuff. And I was like, why does my tooth hurt? And I went to this dentist in Berkeley and he looked at me and he was like, he, he was an African-American dude in Oakland actually. And he was known to see like a lot of Berkeley students. And he went by the name Dr. Happy Tooth because that was, he used to dress up as this character and go to schools and stuff. And so pretty astounding character. This was in the nineties when I was in school there. And um, I was class in 94. And again, I entered in 91 as I was a three-year thing, and which stressed me out. But I wanted to get done with it because I was getting bored of college and I wanted to move on and do some other stuff. And so the guy sees me and he took one look at me and he's like, so where are you in your school right now? I'm like, I'm third year applying to med school, taking the MCAT. He goes, oh yeah, well, you've cracked your crown. I see it all the time. Uh, and uh, this is the deal. And you need a, you know, you need a, a crown on it. You know, you crack your molar, you need a crown on it. And of course I was like, uh, so how much does that cost? Well, that's gonna be $2,000. I'm like, all right, next. So I sucked it up. I ended up recognizing that this was going on. I chilled out a little bit. I was careful at night. I was watching how I'm clamping my teeth. Again, that doesn't work for everyone, but I was able to get through it without needing a um, crown until years later. Now I got, I got some gold in there, son. Um, so again, this stress manifests in physical ways. It's not just, oh, we're stressed out. It manifests uh, severely. So, um, Bill Joyce says, I'm in New York, he's on YouTube. I don't see a way that New York City can return to normal until there's a vaccine. Crowded subways, packed sidewalks, germ-filled offices, getting back to business as usual just isn't happening. And good point, because in areas like New York, it's different. All of this is gonna be local. The problem is we don't have a national public health apparatus, so it's been disjointed. But in New York, it is crowded subways. So what does that mean? It means wear a mask. It means universal masking is one solution. Because you have a place like Hong Kong, that place is crowded as hell. They managed this, right? Of course, they were early and aggressive and they do contact tracing. Um, do you believe that fomitic spread in the general public carries a lower risk for developing serious symptoms? Derek Lee. So Derek on YouTube. Uh, Derek, what he's asking by, when he says fomitic spread, what he's talking about is fomites, which are objects. So does this mouse carry, you know, when we sneeze or we have droplets, we touch our nose and we touch the, mouse and then we touch our eyes, we get infected. That's fomitic spread. And early on, we thought that, that was the major, one of the major routes of spread. So everyone was disinfecting surfaces and freaking out and spraying down roads and doing crazy shit. Well, it's felt to be much less now. It's still possible, but the question is, is the viral load you get from that even significant enough to give you serious symptoms? And the answer is we don't know, we just don't know. I think my suspicion is it is not as important as being in a super spreader event room where there's a hyper emitter breathing out these particles, uncovered face, um, getting in your face and eyes. And you know, Monica Gandhi and I were talking about this. She doesn't think eyes are a major route, but again, we don't know for sure. So yeah, you can get infected. The question is how sick will you get? And I think that's the question you're getting at and we just don't know, Derek, but it's a very important question. Um, Let's see, let's see. Questions, questions, questions. Uh, Sarah Brown got her flu shot last night. Excellent. Um, all right, well, uh, hang on. Debbie Emmel. We have a micro preemie that just came home after 222 days in the NICU. How can we protect him best going from doctor to doctor's office for follow-ups? Well, it's t micro preemie, and this is, I mean, again, I'm not a pediatrician, but I'll say this. The immune system less developed, always at risk for infections and things like that. Been in the NICU for that long, was protected from people wearing masks. So I think masking, hand washing, do not, bring the child close to people that aren't doing those things. And remember that even then, children are quite resilient in the face of this virus. So yours is at more risk than the average child, but still, um, there's something going on in kids. And again, there's a lot of speculation. But now imagine this guy. So l l let's just 
give ourselves a little compassion for a section, you know, as we wrap up here. We, okay, this pandemic is bad. It's killed a lot of people, over 220,000 people in the US alone, right? And these are our vulnerable people. They're minorities, they're older people, they're people with chronic disease. It is not good. But we as a society have done a few things to slow it down. We as healthcare professionals rallied and got more PPE, not enough, but more. We learned how to take care of it. We did bend the curve in the US. We did smear it out. It could have been a lot worse. And we did those things for a viral pandemic with an infection fatality rate that may even be as low as 0.2, which is double a flu season overall. We don't know yet, right? That's still emerging data. Could be as high as 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. We did all that for this, which is pandemic light. Now, people will get so angry at me for saying that pandemic light, millions dead eventually, so much disruption, all of that. This is pandemic light. This is a pandemic that does, does not preferentially affect children. In fact, it preferentially spares them. It tends to affect older people with chronic disease more, and the fatality rate isn't as high. Wait until a pandemic moderate or heavy comes, something that is fully aerosolized, like measles, that's hyper contagious, that's highly fatal, that affects children and adults and people with no other conditions. When that happens, and it will, we better be ready. And what I suspect will happen is people will behave very differently when that comes. First of all, hopefully we've learned something from this. Second of all, They'll see what's going on quite clearly and will behave like we did in the very early days, right? Because there was so much fear and um, concern seeing what was happening. And I think that will be an appropriate response at that point. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of gloom and doom. I think we're gonna get through this okay. We're gonna get through it okay. We gotta stop, again, I don't believe in catastrophizing about this stuff. And I think there is this availability cascade where we're just surrounded. It depends, and you can be surrounded by conspiracy theories and the th thoughts that this is all a hoax if you're in that bubble. And that's not right either. So, you know what I mean? So guys, listen, the last thing I wanna say is, um, I wanna thank the people who support this show by subscribing. If you're on YouTube, click the subscription button and the little bell to turn the notifications on. If you're on Facebook, hit the follow button or the like button. Um, if you wanna support us more because we are we have independent content, content that doesn't rely on outside you know, sources of revenue like ad revenue, which does help us, but it's the support or subscriptions, the $4.99 a month on YouTube and Facebook that actually support the show and keep us able to say whatever it is we think authentically, be authentically true and a true voice that you're not gonna find in a lot of places. So for those who wanna join that tribe, you get live shows with me, Q&A, discussions, early releases, a discussion group on Facebook that is moderated by me, so it's pretty clean of garbage politics and nonsense and mudslinging. We treat each other well because we're self-selecting to be there. Join us. But if you can't do that or won't do that, share this video. Hit like, leave a comment. It helps a lot. All right, guys, I love you guys so much, and we are out. Peace.